Apple's finally got their intelligence. There might be a GPU shortage happening and AMD drops fluid motion frames too. Let's get into the hot news, everybody. I'm your Brett host. We're gonna be going over the hottest tech news I can find on the internet while you enjoy your breakfast this Tuesday, July 30th, 2024. And I tried to pick a new spot to record in and this one sounds way worse than yesterday's episode. So uh, we'll see how I continue to change things up as we record hot news, which is exactly what Apple's trying to do, change things up when it comes to the type of intelligence that they're offering on their devices. And now Apple intelligence is available as part of the developer betas. But unfortunately for most of you, I know the most exciting feature was Genmojis. Those are still not coming out, but you can download the iOS 18.1, iPad OS 18.1 or Mac OS Sequoia 15.1 developer beta, and you can try out the latest AI features that Apple's baking in, but it doesn't include everything such as the Genmoji, but as well as the chat GPT integration and personal context and in-app actions for Siri those are still supposed to be happening later on, but you get things like proofreading, rewriting, summarizing text, or the various things that are happening in the Photos app, as well as some of the Siri updates. It's there to play around with in case you want it, it's now available. But what's also available is an update to Windows 11 that uh, destroys your encryption. Or better put, it just completely breaks BitLocker, which is the encryption program that Microsoft uses on their Windows operating systems. And with the latest Windows 11 update that they released, it forgets your password. So you have to go through the BitLocker recovery process, which means that you either have to have your recovery key that you're supposed to have, or in case you have an online Microsoft account, you can store it with Microsoft and you can potentially log into your Microsoft account to grab it. But uh, they are allegedly pulling this update for right now, but Microsoft not having a great set of 10 days or has it been two weeks when it comes to CrowdStrike and now potentially breaking BitLocker, not, not great. But another update that I'm very excited about, Sony announced a brand new AstroBot controller for the PS5 and I am in love with this thing. The Astro's Playroom demo that came with the PlayStation 5, an incredible showcase of just what the PlayStation 5 can do with all of its technology and what the DualSense can do and having an Astro's Playroom version of that or AstroBot, which is a new platforming game that's based on all of this. That's supposed to be launching September 6th. You can pre-order it for 80 bucks. It's beautiful. In the CGI demo, they showed these little eyes responding as if they're LEDs. If that's the case, I think this is incredible. If it's not, uh, it's still a very beautiful controller and I would consider picking one up, but I need to save a little bit of money first. So maybe Reese can help me with that. Yo, welcome back to EFT Deals, bringing the hottest tech deals on the internet. Happy Tuesday, everyone. And hey, I have some deals for you today. Starting off with this glorious gaming model D super light wide gaming mouse for only $24.99, making it $60 off. But then next up, we have this Bitphoenix Nova Mesh Micro ATX case available in white for only $54.90, making it $24.09 off. And then lastly, we have the Sony WHCH720N wireless noise canceling headphones available specifically in blue for $89.99 making it $60 off. And hey, with that, the deals are done. You can find these and more linked in the video description down below. But until next time, I'm gonna hand you off back to Brett for the rest of your hot news. Cheers. Well, Reese, whatever money you just saved me, I'm gonna spend it all on graphics cards. Big surprise, I know. And Sapphire is quickly turning into one of my favorite GPU companies, especially with all of these different brand partnerships that they've been doing. I recently picked up their Frostpunk 2 GPU, excited to do a build with that when the game finally comes out in September. It was supposed to launch this month, but that got delayed. I wish I could be playing it here on vacation. But they've released a couple of different visual backplates. You have the Frostpunk 2, which I think is gorgeous. They released this other one for Once Human, and then now they have this one for Delta Force Hawk Ops, which again, I just love to see the variety and the various different backplates that GPU companies are experimenting with. And my favorite part about this is that it's not a giveaway. You can actually buy it retail. I got my Frostpunk 2 GPU from Newegg. It doesn't include a copy of the game, which feels like a missed opportunity, but at the same time, it's a gorgeous looking backplate. And I always want to celebrate when companies choose to do something like that and feature it here on Hot News. And I know we've done a lot of crapping on Intel lately here on Hot News. So let's talk about something that we or at least I am very excited about when it comes to Lunar Lake potentially launching in Q3 or Q4. We're getting new benchmarks coming out of the Ultra 9 288V, the flagship Lunar Lake chip with a 30 watt TDP. We're getting Geekbench scores testing out the CPU and it looks to be incredibly fast. And especially with AMD dropping their AI 
300 series chips. Uh, just yesterday, we're still working on our review of the ZenBook S16, as well as we just received the ProArt P X13, I believe it is. So we've got reviews on the new Ryzen AI 300 laptops incoming, but Lunar Lake, especially compared to that, at least in these preliminary benchmark, beats the snot out of the HX370 in terms of single threaded scores on Geekbench 7. Absolutely incredible numbers, but it does fall apart when it comes to multi-threaded scores because it still only has four cores of P and four cores of E. So it's just only an eight core processor, whereas the HX370 is a little bit more robust than that. And you can see that the Intel Core Ultra 9 is doing that at a 30 watt TDP and the HX370 is doing that at 33 watts. But the difference here is that Intel's includes the memory. So Intel is technically running this a little bit better because they're including more power in that total package of 30 watts. So the Ultra 9 288V, terrible name, uh, is looking to be very performant when it comes to single core. It likely shouldn't have all of the, you know, instability issues. Intel's already come out and said that whatever instability is happening on mobile is different than what's happening on desktop. And Lunar Lake, brand new architecture, brand new P cores, brand new E cores. Things are really changing on that side. And I'm actually kind of excited for it. And it's also going to be the first implementation of Battle Mage or XE2 graphics. And I'm excited to potentially review those moving forward but in case you're moving forward wishing that you're going to get a graphics card there might be a little bit of a shortage happening depending on your region allegedly there is a shortage in the gddr6x market so the memory that goes on rtx 4070 gpus and above going all the way up to the 4090 might actually be constrained so there's a message that nvidia sent out to their board partners saying that there's a scarcity going on with this and so the gpu that's most likely to be affected is the RTX 4070 because they're going to prioritize selling the higher end models. So the 4070 might be a little slow over the next little month, but this is also allegedly happening in China, which could have ripple effects out to various different markets, but for the most part appears to be localized in the messaging. But China is a large market. If there's a shortage in one place, that could potentially lead to shortages elsewhere, like we saw with the RTX 4090 when the 4090D came in and people couldn't get them as much. The 4090 started drying up here in the States. It created a whole chain of events down the line. But AMD has come out with a chain of events to make their fluid motion frames better. In case you're not familiar, fluid motion frames is kind of like NVIDIA's frame gen. It's the same general idea in that you're interpolating frames in your video game and so that it's making it run at a faster frame rate but it's generating those frames rather than being rasterized or actually made by your GPU core. But Fluid Motion Frames 2 is now in a technical preview, which gives it some key enhancements. One of the biggest problems we've had with generated frames is the latency it adds. And what we have is Fluid Motion Frames lowering by up to 28% in terms of latency. And there's various different options that you can enable, including that it works in borderless full screen, which it didn't used to, and that it now also works in Vulkan and OpenGL games, which is a high improvement from how it was previously. You can see here what a AMD has chosen to prioritize with Fluid Motion Frames 2. So you can download the technical preview in case you're interested and try it out for yourself. But you can see here in Cyberpunk, 28% lower. In Counter-Strike 2, it's 12% lower. But that is one of the biggest weaknesses when it comes to this generated frames is that you can actually notice the response input is just not the same. When I've played Cyberpunk 2077 with everything turned on, including frame gen, it feels a little bit more floaty than when you have frame gen turned off. And I've read a few reports of some people who have tried this out and things like Jedi Survivor and what they're saying is that you can actually feel the difference between Fluid Motion Frames 2 and Fluid Motion Frames 1, which is fantastic. This is where you want it to be. However, the big bummer here is that AMD has not enabled this for any other GPU besides the RX 6000 and RX 7000 series. So if you're not on those GPUs, this is not going to be available. It doesn't appear to be something that you can be working on if you're on a Battle Mage card or a 1080 Ti. Maybe somebody can get it working at some point, as tends to happen as these things stay out on the market. But for right now, it's good that AMD has an alternative, a competitor. I like to see it. And I like to see your comments. So let's talk about what you said in yesterday's episode of Hot News. Over on Floatplane, we got Kryptonite saying, IMO CrowdStrike was very clear. They think their customers' continued business is worth $10. Not just a $10 credit, 
right? Like, so if those get unredeemed, maybe they can like get the money back. So it's net over, if you average it over everybody, it's a little less than $10. That's, that's my thought. Then over on YouTube, we got Chairman Meow saying, no comment is not acceptable when we're months and months into the problem. I happen to agree. I think that the things Intel didn't have a comment on with regards to warranty or with regards to how easy they're gonna make it. It's just unacceptable. But then also at the same time, I saw a couple of people being like, well, there's various different regions and they can't quite say for everything, but then they can say that in a statement, right? They can come out and say, while it's gonna vary from region to region here in the United States, since The Verge is an American reporting agency, they could have talked about the American implications for it and then prefaced what they said with that qualifier and that still would have been more of an acceptable answer for people to know what's going on. Right now, it doesn't feel like they're not saying anything because it's too complicated. It feels like they're not saying anything because they don't have an answer, which is, again, not where you want to be months into a problem at this point for what is a company that's worth hundreds of billions of dollars. But then we got GV100 Blitz saying Intel definitely just waiting until 13th gen warranties expire. I don't think that's quite it. I, I think that, uh, you know, people can still buy 13th gen CPUs now. They just like stopped producing them. So they're going to be on shelves for a little while. And then you have an extra however many years of the warranty on top of that. It's not like it's going to happen soon, right? Like the problem exists right now. Warranties on the 13th gen are not expiring anytime soon, especially when you can still pick them up out on the open market. And then you also got J.I. Pillow saying all of the affected Intel CPUs were on heavy discount two weeks ago during Prime Day is when Intel knew there was a problem. I would disagree with that. We did the Prime Day live stream here on YouTube where we evaluated all of the deals and I found that Intel's CPU sales were actually very lackluster. AMD had much better CPU sales. I mean, Intel did have these chips on sale, but it was no more than they normally were. Like we were evaluating the price tracking for each of the chips and I don't, I think one Intel CPU made it on our like certified banger list of deals that you could pick up. So I, I don't think that Intel was like putting them on sale to get people to buy them. But I do think it's a little weird that Intel's allowing people to buy a product that actually is unstable right now and still has it out on the mar open market. This is wild. And then we got Carl saying, one thing people forget about the Intel fiasco, what will happen to the value of CPUs that people already own? Would you buy a used 4900K for hundred bucks? Sure, right? Like if it decreases that value to the point where the open market says, hey, it's actually worth less than it was when and, you know, it was relevant in mainstream. The open market can dictate that it's it's actually going to be worth a lot less. And then I'm sure there are people who are going to pick it up because a uh, 4900K at five gigahertz in order to get it stable is still better than a lot of CPUs out there. Like that is like one of one of the, it, like these CPUs aren't useless when they're degraded, right? Like they still perform. They just perform worse than what Intel promised that they would, which is a massive issue, especially if they're not handling RMAs appropriately, but that doesn't make them worth less, right? Like we gave away a 14900 KS system right around the time that this news broke and people came in to our live stream when we gave it away and they were just saying things like, oh, why would you do this? And it was like, it's a free chip, right? Like it's, uh, if you have to down clock the 14900 KS to 4.5 gigahertz you still got 24 cores for free from ufd tech like it's better than me giving you nothing so while you're not getting peak perfect performance it's not that they're completely worthless on the other side of it and then we have this comment saying i don't understand why reviewers are not strict enough with intel clearly these faulty cpus are causing massive damage and the microcode update will not fix damaged cpus it'll just presumably prevent cpus that haven't been damaged yet from being damaged by doing what and saying all this and what we hear from reviewers is wait for intel's microcode essentially recommending intel but only after the update and downgrade take place why are they not saying amd is more stable, consumes way less power, releases much less heat, and performs really well. I've got a question, who are you watching? I haven't seen many people who aren't just outrightly condemning Intel for what's happening right now, and then also saying buy AMD because it's currently the best option out on the market based on relevant data that's here now. Like, when you're saying it consumes less power, is more stable, releases much less heat, performs really well, where'd you learn that? Do you buy all of them and you've tested them or did you learn that from reviewers so you got that data? Who's telling you to go buy Intel right now? When, when you say reviewers, I'm like, I don't know who you're talking about, right? Like on this channel, I 
I'm calling out Intel nearly every single episode for what's going on. Most other tech YouTubers that I watch are saying the same thing. So I'm just curious who who's saying, yeah, just buy the 14900K and wait for the microcode update. Here, we're saying if you want a 14900K, don't buy it right now. Wait until Intel actually delivers on the promise, right? And like, there's this aspect of even if, right, AMD is the best option on the market, some people still want to buy Intel and that's their choice. I can't make them buy AMD. But at the same time, right, like back when AMD was completely losing, you had the FX 8300, 8350, all of those CPUs, 9590, people still bought those. There's plenty of people still running FX chips out there, even though they very much weren't the best option at the time. And the choice is pe theirs for people to do it. So if you're gonna buy an Intel CPU, I'd recommend waiting until Intel actually delivers on their promises. But you know, I can't I can't convince everybody to buy what what I think is the best idea. There's multiple options out there for a reason. And then we got two comments that I also want to address from Monk and Oysterhead saying, these Intel CPUs also have oxidation issue, not just a voltage issue. Gamers Nexus did a video on it. And then Oysterhead saying, I wouldn't hold your breath about getting an EK water block for anything. The company went belly up and is in financial ruin. Owning employees back pay, vendors not being paid, not keeping contract deals, it's a mess. Gamers Nexus did a huge expose on them a couple months ago. They are pathetic to say least. People keep coming out to say these things, like like the oxidation issue, Intel's already addressed. We've already talked about that here on Hot News. The oxidation issue was a small batch of CPUs with exclusively the 13th gen that Intel already fixed. They already came out and said, this has been fixed for a little while. And anybody who has that, you can contact Intel support and we'll take care of you. That's a completely separate issue that's already been addressed. The, like 14th gen should not have any appearance of oxidation. So the Gamers Nexus expose on that, while helpful for diagnosing, is it relevant to the larger conversation that's being happening with things like the i3-14100 being potentially bugged or the 13600K? That's more relevant than the oxidation issue in terms of the number of people it actually affects. And then also with the EK thing, the Gamers Nexus did an expose on it, but that was the American arm of the company. It doesn't look like EK Slovenia is in much dire straits. They're still gonna be making stuff. EK will still exist, even if the US arm had bad financial practices based on whatever was happening in the EU department. They, they're still around. It was the American company that had problems. So like people come out and they like try to throw Gamers Nexus as like a, hey, hey, bad bad, bad, this, this is, you, you're not catching all of the negative. And in reality, like I've watched the, the report Steve has come out with. I'm not, I'm not, not consuming that information. I just also hear everything he has to say, take it into consideration and synthesize it with the rest of the information that's out there instead of just saying, well, Gamers Nexus said this. And then Shauner said, Brett calling people out in the comments is probably my favorite part of hot news. Um, well, Shauner, that's just like your opinion, man. And um, go fly a kite. Sorry, I've met Shauner in person uh, during the cannibal stream. So that was a lighthearted jest. Please don't make it seem like I'm actually angry at people. I'm sorry. And then we got Winter Mute saying, yeah, nah, I was already not fond of Intel for their high ass power draw for these last bunch of years. But now the no comment response, I'm so glad I haven't had an Intel chip since the legendary 7700K. Brother, the 7700K? wasn't legendary. I'm sorry. I had I have to break this to you. The 7700K is the 14900K in in terms of where it is in the market. The 7700K was just kind of a rebadged 6700K. KB Lake was no different than Skylake, just a couple extra 100 megahertz in clock frequency and a little tuning. Could do a little better in the extreme overclocking end. That's what the 14900K is. It's just the beefed up 13900K. Nothing about the 7700K was legendary. Everything you enjoy about that chip was the 6700K from Skylake. Ah, your chip is boring. <laughs> Sorry. All right, done dunking on people. Let's have a more positive comment response tomorrow. That's what I want. Can we be done with the Intel thing unless they put their foot in the mouth and say a little bit more negativity? I, I hope we can be leaving it here.